Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Haskam, Director of the Library, and I'm delighted to have you here this evening for this talk about mystery writers. This is a, a hugely popular genre at the Cornwall Library. We really try to stay on top of, of the, the new authors and to keep, to keep the old ones in the collection as well. So our speakers today are Jim Fishman and Greg Galloway. Um, Jim is a professor of law at uh, Pace Law School. He received his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and JD and PhD from New York University. Um, he is a self-described addict of detective fiction and has lectured on the history of the genre. Um, and he has given a couple of talks at the Cornwall Library before. But today he's joined by Greg Galloway, Greg is the author of the Alex award-winning novel, As Simple as Snow, The 39 Deaths of Adam Strand in the short story collection, Careful and Other Stories. Just Thieves, the books we'll be talking about today was published in October of 2021. Uh, Greg earned his master's from the University of Iowa and his MFA from Iowa Writers Workshop. He lives in Cornwall and importantly, he writes also for the Cornwall Chronicle. So we have uh, a nice crowd today. And um, of course, we're gonna have to keep everybody muted, but we will, um, we will have questions and answers at the end. Shari Goodfriend will be handling the chat. Here she is. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat box. And of course, we'll also be recording this. So it will be on our website in a few days. It takes a bit to edit it and get it going. So I think that's everything for me. Um, Jim, you wanted to start first? Are you ready yeah, to go? I just want to thank okay. you, yeah, Margaret, for organizing it and Sherry for doing all the work in public relations and uh, handling this, this video. Uh, I'm not an expert in detective fiction. As uh, Margaret said, I'm an addict and not even mm -hmm. uh, uh, a recovering one. Uh, many prominent people have loved crime fiction Abe Lincoln and Joseph Stalin really uh, admired Edgar Allan Poe, who sort of uh, invented the genre. Freud loved the books of Dorothy Sayers. And Bill Clinton is a uh, fiction, uh, a detective fiction addict. And when he became president, uh, he told his staff that I'm going to read two serious nonfiction books for every uh, detective fiction. Uh, Mr. Clinton has a lot of good qualities, but willpower is not one of them. And after a very short time, he, he just ignored that uh, pledge. Um, others prominent in uh, a particular field have tried their hand at detective fiction. A. A. Milne, who uh, is the author of Winnie the Pooh, uh, wrote one novel, The Red House Mystery, which actually was very successful and went through 13 editions. Interestingly, in the uh, so-called golden age period uh, between the world wars, uh, many uh, detective fiction writers had uh, other careers and used pseudonyms for their detective no novels. Uh, Cecil Day Lewis was poet laureate of uh, England and a professor of poetry at Harvard and at Oxford. And uh, he published 20 uh, volumes of detective fiction under the name of Nic Nicholas Blake. Um, one of his children is uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, the, the actor. Uh, John Innes McIntosh Stewart, uh, a very urbane and literate writer, was a professor at Oxford who wrote full-length studies of Joyce, Hardy, um, and Conrad, and uh, was the author of Eight Modern Writers, which was the final volume of Oxford's uh, history of uh, English literature. He also wrote 50 uh, detective novels as Michael Innes, which he called entertainments, uh, and they abound in literary illusion and wit. Uh, then as now, I guess, uh, academics had a lot of free time on their hands. Uh, Edward Crispin was a pseudonym for uh, Robert Montgomery, who was a musician and composer, and had his first crime novel and musical composition accepted for publication when he was an undergraduate at Oxford. Um, he, uh, Gervais Finn is his, his detective. Uh, and uh, Crispin also wrote scores for 40 films, operas, and church music. Uh, Cyril Hare, Hare was a judge. And G.D. Cole and his wife were economists who together wrote uh, 
as co-authors 29 detective fiction novels. Um, detective stories, said Cecil Day Lewis, uh, were mostly read by the upper and professional classes and thrillers by those with less money and inferior social status. Uh, the values from the time of, of Sherlock Holmes, which is really a turn of the 20th century, through the golden age, are those of a class who had everything to lose by social change. English uh, crime literature till the end of World War II offered a reassuring world in which those who tried to disturb the established order were discovered and punished. Authors were strong supporters of law and order and of the police. The police were not corrupt. Society's agent was a detective who reflected society's heroic values, high intellectual attainments, and usually was an amateur, a fact which enabled many readers to identify with them. Uh, often the sidekick, the detective has a sidekick who is less able and a foil. Many detective novelists portrayed a middle class but satisfied society, rural and peaceable, even though the reality of life in rural areas was undergoing a lot of stress during the interwar period. In the English detective novels of this time, the detectives don't chase women. No sex pleas were British. Uh, there were underlying anxieties uh, in the interwar period and uh, detective fiction uh, offered an ordered hierarchical society of great concern lay unease about the violent, violent overturning of, of society. Um, and the country really hadn't recovered from the carnage of World War I. Uh, and so the British detective story brought order out of disorder. And it was a genre of reconciliation and social hearing. Um, <clears throat> to the end of World War II, uh, English, uh, detective stories were uh, distinct or, or really uh, free from uh, the realities of violence. Country houses still existed, but by 1939, uh, they had vanished pretty much uh, in the countryside. The police are impeccably correct when interviewing su suspects in the drawing rooms of country houses, the societies of rural uh, clergy, uh, I'm sorry, the studies of rural clergy, uh, or the rooms of an Oxford academic. Police brutality is absent uh, as the police represented established society. Crime and violence are aberrations. There's no real pity for victims, uh, no empathy for murderers, and no uh, real sympathy for the poor, except those on fixed income. Uh, the no novels were kind of a fairy tale um, <clears throat> where you escaped from what was disagreeable in life. Um, all is right in the end. Uh, detectives were well connected, usually of a higher class than the typical policeman or detective we think of. For instance, uh, Dorothy Sayers, Lord Peter Whimsey, uh, is the second son of the Duke of Denver. Uh, he drives a Daimler double six V12 limousine and has a valet bunter. Uh, Sayers was asked, why would you create a, uh, a, a character that drives such a limousine? She said, at the time I wrote that, I didn't have the money for bus fare. Michael Innes's detective, John Appleby, was erudite and a gentleman. In Death of the Pre of, at the President's Lodging, which takes place in an Oxford college. The Dons open up to Appleby only after they conclude or realize that he's a gentleman. Uh, ironically, Oxford in the golden age seemed to be the murder capital of detective fiction in England. Uh, Mar Marjorie Allingham's uh, <clears throat> Albert Campion comes from an aristocratic background. And by the end of her series, he's become a Viscount, which is a, a, a fairly high role in, in position in the peerage. Uh, Niall Marsh's uh, detective was Roderick Allen. 
And in A Man Lay Dead, each of the suspects at some point comment that he didn't look like a, a plainclothes policeman, that, oh, he has an Oxford accent, uh, or, gee, he resembles a guest at uh, the uh, country house where the murder took place. Um, we learn that Alan was a diplomat before becoming a detective, and he has a townhouse in London. His mother was Lady Allen uh, and a breeder of Alsatians, Alsatians. I suggest the next time you have a conversation with a policeman or a policewoman, you ask uh, if uh, he or she has a townhouse in uh, Soho uh, and uh, that uh, his or her mother raises Alsatians. I'm sure you'll be able to, to post bail after, after doing that. Um, World War II ended the golden age. Um, <clears throat> at the time, there were no, almost no female detectives, but many truly excellent women authors. It, it's really amazing how the women authors were really at the top of the, uh, of the group of, of writers. Uh, one author that uh, is the Rodney Dangerfield, you remember him, you know, I can't get any respect, uh, was Agatha Christie. Uh, she produced year after year puzzle stories of ver varied ingenuity, constant liveliness, and she has sold two billion copies of her books. She's third, apparently, uh, amongst uh, English uh, books after the Bible and Shakespeare. Uh, she wasn't a great writer, but she was supreme in constructing puzzles. Um, she, her, her plots are not really good, but she tricks the reader. She's uh, been said to be obsessively concerned with poisoning. And the reason I think is that during the First World War, she worked in a hospital pharmacy and probably, this was before she was a writer and probably came to know a lot about, uh, about uh, poisons. Uh, one critic said, if you figure out who did it, you, you can stop reading. I, I really think that's unfair. Uh, Dorothy Sayers uh, was in the first graduating class uh, of women from Oxford. Women could attend classes for a while, but they couldn't sit for a, a, a degree. She was a medievalist, uh, a translator of Dante, uh, the 14th century Italian. Uh, of Dante and a poet. She was a good writer, uh, I think particularly good at dialogue. She was controversial. She was very snobbish, intellectually arrogant, witty, uh, but she was a, some writer. Uh, a couple of writers who um, emerged in the uh, middle of the 30s were Marjorie Allingham and Niall Marsh, both of whom I've mentioned. Allingham wrote 20 novels full of character and mystery, very evocative of place. Uh, she felt that the detective's function was a reflection of society's conscience. Niall Marsh, a uh, New Zealander, um, <clears throat> like Allingham, was more than just a creator of ingenious puzzlers, but a serious novelist of social realism. Um, she uh, also was snobbish, she idealized a nostalgic uh, ver view of England, uh, but she de developed a rich variety of characters. Uh, her deaths were shocking, unlike many writers, uh, and she really should have a better legacy uh, than, she, than she does uh, today. Uh, Josephine Tay, the, a pseudonym for Elizabeth McIntosh, was a writer who really subverted it's very subtly, the standard conventions of the golden age and whose work was often a portent of the future development of detective fiction. Uh, she was an influence of, on uh, Pat Highsmith, for instance. Her novel, The Daughter of Time, was rated in 1990 by the British crime writers as the best bit British crime fiction novel ever written. Uh, I read it. It's a good book. I, I don't know if it's worth that, but I, I don't know. Uh, who am I? Uh, one of the criticisms of the Golden Age was that many books consisted of snobbery with violence. Uh, for Sayers, she was an intellectual snob. 
Marsh was a social snob and Tay was a class snob. Uh, one of the uh, writers that both Greg and I really like uh, was born in Belgium and wrote in France. And, and uh, this is George Seminone, uh, who published an estimated 200 to 300 novels. Nobody knows how many because he used synonyms. It often took him two weeks to write a novel. Greg, do you want to say something about uh, one of our favorites? Yeah, so uh, Simonon sort of bridges bridges the gap for me from the English novel that, that Jim talked about to the American Hard Boiled. And he sort of, he wrote both. He had uh, his detective McGray, who he introduced in 1930, who sort of fits more comfortably in the English style. And then he had what he called his hard novels, which really sort of is influenced by the American Hard Boiled novels of the early 30s. Uh, Simonon also, as we'll, I want Jim to talk about, he lived up in Lakeville and wrote uh, a number of novels up in Lakeville. Uh, you know, he he published, I think, 10 novels a year on average. So it's like, I think I've probably read maybe 40 Simonon novels, which is, you know, gets me to about 20% or less from his oeuvre. So, you know, you can read 100 Simonon novels and barely make a dent on his on his total output. But talk, talk about talk about Lakeville a little bit, Jim, because that's very interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I will. But also, uh, uh, picking up what you, what you just said, uh, Alfred Hitchcock once called him. And uh, uh, the woman answered, uh, answered the phone and said, well, he's writing a novel. And Hitchcock said, I'll hold. Uh, he, he was that uh, quick. But uh, the reason he wound up in Lakeville, and there's uh, a volume that collected uh, five novels of his that the library has. And it's really just so odd to see uh, Goshen mentioned and uh, Torrington and, and things of that sort. But the reason he wound up in Lakeville was uh, during the Second World War, uh, he helped with uh, uh, when uh, the Germans overran Belgium, he helped with the refugees. But after the occupation, he uh, allowed, uh, made a deal with the Germans that they could publish some of his books and also turn some of them into novels. And after uh, the war ended, uh, he was afraid and was accused by some of being a collaborator. Uh, and he was afraid he would not be able to publish. So he left uh, and came to the United States, uh, stayed in a few places and wound up in Lakeville uh, he came with his uh, first wife, his second wife, a cook, and his son. His son went to Hotchkiss. Um, I don't know how to say this delicately, but uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, hobbies uh, or activities of uh, Simonone was uh, in the afternoon, uh, he would often go to brothels. Uh, I, I doubt very much at that time that Lakeville uh, had many. Uh, if indeed they have any today. But he came uh, with uh, three people. His wife, as part of the divorce settlement, uh, had to be taken wherever the son was. And apparently he had sexual relations with both wives and also the, uh, the cook. Um, after he, I guess he, he didn't fit in there and uh, he left after, I think he was there 10 years. Is that is that right, Greg? I think you know? so. I think so. And uh, I've read a couple of his Lakeville novels, which to your point, it's very, it's very odd to, to have him name drop towns around us. He does not call Lakeville Lakeville, uh, but he wrote um, The Hand, which is a great uh, winter novel, which is, uh, he's at, uh, the main character is at, I think, a New Year's Eve party, and they get with another couple stuck in a snowstorm. And as they go from the road to the house, the couples get separated and um, the protagonist, his wife and his friend's wife make it back to the house. And the fourth individual, the friend's husband does not come back. And he says, he'll go out and find him. And instead of finding him, he goes to the barn and has a cigarette knowing that the friend will die in the snowstorm. And that's just the beginning of the novel. It gets much bleaker after that. And then he also uh, wrote a novel called Bell, which is about a, a French foreign exchange student, young girl who goes to a private school called Crestview, which is clearly 
Hotchkiss, and um, she is uh, raped and murdered. And the the perpetrator may or may not be a professor, a teacher over at Crestview. So those those are two local local novels that I've read that Simonon did. Well, you know the the, uh, the between the uh, American and English novels, uh, it's it, it's almost there, the writers are not only on two continents. It's like they uh, are are in two different centuries. Um, Greg, uh, would you uh, s tell us how the you think the American novels novelists uh, differed from the English, and how did the American ones uh, influence your work? And so. Chandler talks about how, you know, basically what the American crime fiction writers did was they they took the Venetian vase and from England and threw it in the alley. Um, a lot of the American, what came to be known as hard boiled, the detective is sort of outside the law. And in fact, he oftentimes has, has an adversarial relationship with the police, um, either has done something in his past. Some of them are former policemen. Um, and while the crime might be solved, the corruption of society remains. The, a lot of the American fiction of the 30s really looked at um, capitalism. Uh, uh, oftentimes, the detectives are hired by sort of corrupt, wealthy individuals. That's one of the tropes of the 30s. Um, and society itself is corrupt. The police are corrupt. Every Almost every aspect of society is corrupt. So while the individual crime might be solved, the, the detective does not resolve society at all, unlike England, which sort of puts puts things back in its place. Um, for me, two of the two of the key writers are Dashiell Hammett, who himself was a detective. He he worked for a time for the Pinkerton Agency, um, and he was disillusioned by that work by the violence that the Pinkertons used, especially towards union workers. Uh, I think he was sent out to Butte, Montana. And it just turned his stomach on, on how the Pinkertons treated the strike strikers out there. Um, he's the only one of sort of the golden age that was an actual detective. Um, Chandler worked for Raymond Chandler worked for an oil company. Uh, James M. Kane was a, a journalist. He was also for a very brief time uh, managing editor of the New Yorker magazine. Um, Kane really takes things from hard boiled and turns it into noir, which is sort of one of my, my key interests. Um, and we'll sort of get into that a little bit. Noir was applied later. Noir came out of France in 1945 when a publisher there started republishing a lot of the writing of, of Americans in the 30s and early 40, 40s and called it the Noir series, which is how the name got, got, its, got taken its place. Um, a year later, 1946, the French applied it to film, and that's sort of how the association is now. Uh, the Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler is often called the first noir novel, um, but it really fits more in the detective fiction than noir. And sort of how, how noir differs is that it shifts, shifts from the detective to more of the perpetrator of the crime. And oftentimes it's a, a corruption of the individual Sort of one of the best, uh, I guess, the encapsulations of noir is um, Walter Neff from Double Indemnity, where um, you know he's an insurance salesman that sort of gets lured into committing murder, and he sort of sums up everything and says, that, you know, I did it for the money, and I did it for a girl. I didn't get the money, and I didn't get the girl. That's sort of <laughs> that's that's noir, and he's sort of um, and also. While the novella was written by James M. Cain, Chandler wrote the screenplay. Um, Chandler wrote a no worked on a number of movies, including The Blue Dahlia, which was original screenplay, but especially for um, Double Indemnity, almost everything, if you've seen the movie and read the novella, is such an improvement. Almost everything that people say they like about Double Indemnity is Chandler's work on the movie and not the novella. Even Cain said the, the Chandler's work was far superior than what he had produced. However, Kane produced um, Postman Always Rings twice in, I think, 1934. Um, that book had a profound influence on the French. Uh, Simonon wrote The Widow, 
which was his interpretation of Postman Always Rings Twice. And Albert Camus uh, wrote The Stranger, which is definitely predicated on Postman Always Rings Twice. Uh, Simonon, as you know, Jim, was very competitive. And they both came out the same year. And Simonon had bragged that he win the, would win the Nobel Prize. Yes. And when he went to Camus, Camus, he was infuriated. Um, Sartre was a huge fan of Hammett. Uh, particularly Red Harvest, which was which was published in 1929, um, but both of those French writers studied studied those American counterparts, and Sartre really saw existentialism in the work of of Hammett. Uh, Hammett, while he wrote a number of short stories in the 20s, uh, he re- only wrote five novels. Four of them are considered the greatest American crime fiction ever written, if not of any crime fiction in English. Uh, he was done in 1934. That's the, the last novel that he published, The Thin Man. It's which, a tragic figure. Very tragic. Um, oh. he, had served yeah, he, in world, he, he had served in World War I. He survived the Spanish flu. Uh, he contracted tuberculosis. Um, he, in his 40s, he volunteered in World War II and served. Um, and then he was basically destroyed by the uh, McCarthyism in the 50s. Hammett had worked for a charity organization, I believe to put up a uh, bail for, for some of the HUAC um, people under investigation. And when he was uh, asked to name names, he refused and, and spent time in prison. Um, when he died in 1961, none of his novels were in print. And, you know, he's very much, for me, a sympathetic figure. And also what I love, love about Hammett is uh, his style. His sentences are uh, crisp and clean. Um, and there is much debate about who influenced whom. Hem- did Hemingway influence Hammett or did Hammett influence Hemingway? Uh, Hemingway wrote The Killers in 1927, which is very much uh, Hammett-like crime story. Um, but uh, he sort of, Hammett is sort of the, the pinnacle of, uh, for Raymond Chandler, and Chandler was no small shakes either. Um, obviously, he called, oh. yeah, and, and different styles, but similar in some ways. Ch- Chandler has sentences that will stop you uh, dead, in, dead in your tracks. Uh, one of my favorite lines is, you know, she had a face like a birthday cake with an ice pick in it, which I don't know if you can paraphrase that. I don't even know exactly what it means, but I sort of understand what he's saying. Um, the other writer that I want to talk about uh, more in the noir vein is Dorothy Hughes. Uh, she, her first novel was published in 1940. In 1946, she published uh, In a Lonely Place, which if you've seen the Humphrey Bogart movie, that's another case where the movie really has nothing to do with the source material. Uh, In a Lonely Place um, is way ahead of its time, Uh, deals with a serial killer who believes that he's smarter than his best friend who's the the investigator working the case um, and actually chums up with him to help him solve the murders that the the protagonist has committed. The protagonist is suffering from PTSD. He was a a fighter pilot in the war. Um, And Hughes Hughes talks about how his character was damaged by the war. She also, that that novel really investigates sort of um, toxic masculinity. Um, And her protagonist, Dick Steele, um, you know, I always say it's like, if you take out the psychopath of him, he's he's James Bond. He's men love him. He believes women love him. He's always he he thinks of women in a sexual fashion first and then murder later. But he's sort of an archetype that we see, you know, from Don Draper and Mad Men to, as I said, James Bond. And as I said, that that novel was published in 1946. She's a terrific writer. Um, and uh, I should also mention a, a through line from that, from the movies that was made into a movie in, I think, 50 with Humphrey Bogart. She also did uh, Ride the Pink Horse 
in uh, 1946, was made, made into a movie in 1947. And she was a journalist as well as a poet. And uh, Dorothy Hughes got her start by writing a examination of um, Earl Stanley Gardner, uh, who introduced Perry Mason in 1933. And, you know, all of those novels, you know, that, that came out of the 30s, both the hard boiled and the noir novels, you know, they really, they really provide a great examination of a turbulent time. And for me, that's sort of why noir is still relevant. Uh, and it's why those novels still resonate is because, you know, even in turbulent times now, it's like a, a lot of the heart of sort of the American dream that we call it uh, is really looked at in, cl in close detail in those novels. And for me, the noir novel, as I said, it had a huge influence on the existentialists. And um, the noir novel really deals with some fundamental questions that go back to you know, the Greek tragedies or Shakespeare and ask the questions, you know, why are we here? A lot of noir novels deal with uh, identity. Um, Nightmare Alley, which has uh, been remade again and is nominated for some Academy Awards that came out in 1946. And it's really about a, a con man who sort of shifts identities as the situation arises. And as the novel goes through his rise and fall um, near the end of the novel, is really like a three or four page um, examination of where he's on his way down to the, the very depths. And he's just pleading with some hobos on a train to explain to him, why am I here? Why are we here? Um, why would the universe create a slaughterhouse is what he calls it. And he references King Lear. Why, why would a God swat us away as flies? And it's like that sort of to me is the is one of the essential components of noir, which is which is an examination of those those questions. Uh, why are we here? What are we doing? And do we have a choice? Um, as Nightmare Alley says, you know, we we flop around until the the gentle boot of providence squashes us. Um, and you know the. Nightmare Alley opens with a epigraph from The Wasteland, as well as an epigraph from the Satyricon. And in that epigraph, um, the, the quote is, uh, he, asked, he asked her what she wanted, and she replied, I want to die. And then the novel gets probably bleaker from there. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to read that uh, in this particular <laughs> he, period. He, of, uh, he's a good, American he's life. a good writer, William Lindsay Gresham. He's a good writer and also a horrible, horribly sad story. Um, he, he had a brief popularity uh, with Nightmare Alley in 46 and it was immediately banned and censored. Um, he was married to Joy Davidman who left him for C.S. Lewis. Uh, and Nightmare Alley sort of, again, as, as great noir does, it sort of looks at everything as a scam. And so, you know, he's a phony mentalist, but he also looks at psychotherapy as a scam, religion as a scam, everything as a scam. Um, Gresham unfortunately committed suicide. And when he committed suicide, they found on him a business card that all it said on it was um, no address, no phone, no money, no future. Uh, that that reminds me with Chandler. Um, he worked for the oil company, and that work ended in 1932. But it was not because of the depression. Uh, he was fired because he was harassing women, and also uh, threatening to commit suicide. Uh, so it's really kind of surprising and he didn't start writing until he was 42 years old um, and only wrote seven novels so there's a lot of sadness I think there too. There is and um, Chandler famously argued with almost everyone he collaborated with he and Billy Wilder did not get along during during Double Indemnity. Chandler actually makes a cameo in Double Indemnity he's, he's sitting outside Neff's office at one point but they fought all the time. And I believe they separately wrote memos to the studio why the, why the other should get fired. Um, 
but Chandler struggled with alcoholism and Billy Wilder said that that he couldn't stand uh, Chandler, but work, from working with him, he was able to write The Lost Weekend, which Billy Wilder won the Academy Award for. Um, Hitchcock uh, hired Chandler uh, to work on uh, Patricia Highsmith's Strangers on a Train. I believe that's 1950 or thereabouts. And they couldn't get along. Uh, Chandler wrote two drafts of the screenplay and then Hitchcock overheard uh, Chandler call him a fat bastard and fired him. <laughs> uh, uh, why don't we, we turn to your book, your most recent book, Just Thieves. Um, I guess, uh, how, how did you come upon the subject matter? I mean, how, how do you, what's the process of, of, of writing a book? I mean, is it plot first? Is it characters? Uh, is it setting? How do you envision uh, writing a book? Yeah. But don't me, give away anything because we want the people to read your book. We certainly do. Uh, uh, for me, it's, it, it's usually a sentence that starts it. Um, and in this particular instance, it was just a conversation that I heard two guys having about things of value. Uh, and they determined that anything that can be bought can be rebought, but personal items can't be replaced. And that led me to think about who would have that conversation and I uh, decided that they were sitting in a car waiting to steal something from this house. And it really ended up going from there. And sort of how I write is that I try to eavesdrop on people and um, fictional people. Um, and you told me the story that Simonon liked to sort of walk around and actually inhabit his characters yeah. and, and think the way they think. I don't, I, try not to get that close to the characters, but I do, I do eavesdrop on them. And a lot of this came out of conversations that people had. And then, um, you know, I just sort of think about those characters obsessively and think about how the world in which they live. And for me, uh, plot is secondary and how things turn out, I never think about. I just try to follow these people uh, and hope that it leads somewhere. Well, and uh, then, at what um, point? you know, I should Sorry. say that at, at some point in the novel, uh, I had to come up with what they stole. And uh, I had the setup that it was something that wasn't of material value, but it would be something that people sought after. And so I thought that it would be like Hitchcock's MacGuffin, that it would be something that, that's introduced and then sort of goes away. Um, but it ended up being more like a trophy. And then I thought of the Maltese Falcon, and then I had a decision to make, should I pull back from my references to the Falcon? And instead I sort of leaned forward and the book has a number of references to everybody from Dorothy Hughes to Mamet to, you know, almost every crime fiction writer I can think of as well as a number of crime movies. So at what point, though, do you reach your conclusion in terms of you figured it out? Um, I try to delay that as long as possible. I sort of find that that the earlier I have something figured out, the less interest I have. Um, and then that said, I think this one, I think with this particular book, I think that I wrote the ending maybe two or three times. I know the, the first go around I wasn't happy with, so I had to go back. And then as usually what happens is, you know, the minute you rewrite the ending, you sort of have to rewrite a lot of the other stuff. And so always the beginning is, is the last thing that I write. And the, the little scene that I set up, the, the genesis of the whole novel, that ends up being, you know, almost 70 pages into the book. So the beginning's never the beginning. Um, and the beginning is always at the end. Now, what is your attitude towards the protagonists as they develop? Uh, I mean, how do you, when I read the book, I, I really was interested in the, in, in the two main protagonists. Um, and they seem very, very complex. 
And so how do you build those layers of complexity? There are a lot of people who think they can write detective fiction. I am one person who there's no way in the world I, I, I could ever do that. Um, and so, you know, just how do you build the complexities that makes a character interesting as both uh, your main characters I found very interesting, uh, very different, uh, how do you create? Them? I think a lot of it is, you know, I do, I like them. Uh, you know, I would never want to be in their company, but I do, I do like them. Um, and I, they're people that I'm interested in myself. I'm curious about them. And, you know, that for me is sort of the investigation as a fiction writer is, is who are these people? Um, you know, where do they come from? Where are they going? And just obsessively <laughs> sort of looking at that. And you know when when the writing is going well, they sort of lead me. As I said, it's more of me observing them than it is me creating them. When it's going well, mm -hmm. you, you know, you, then I have as a writer choices to make, obviously. Um, but it really is sort of like it's pe people I want to be around that I'm interested in in who they are and and everything about them. Um, Eddie Dugan, who is a noir writer and critic, has, has uh, said, quote, the distinction between hard-boiled and noir fiction is that psychological instability is the key characteristics of the protagonists of noir writing, if not of the noir writers themselves. Uh, do you have any comment on that? <laughs> yeah, I will leave that for someone else to figure out, but um, yeah. Um, Perhaps for some, I mean, I, I think we have enough examples that that may be true. I hope I'm an example that it's not true, but we'll see. <laughs> well, I, I was only, I was teasing. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you working on a new book now? I am, um, I am, you know, I have, I have nothing figured out, but um, yeah, it's, it's in a, it's in a similar vein. It's sort of, uh, you know, some reviewers have talked about how this book other than the the modern technology could sort of exist back in the in the golden age, if you will. Um, this book is clearly post pandemic. The pandemic plays a little bit part of it, and um, you know that was sort of um, I think a difficult decision to make. But um, I'm going with it, and we'll see where it heads. And about how how long does it take you to to write? I assume it's more than two weeks. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could be Simonon. I would, you know, I don't know how many hours in the day, but between his writing and his mistresses and his wives and mm. everything, it's like he must have had a lot more hours in the day than we do. Um, yeah, for me, it takes, I think I've been averaging about two years. And, you know, if I can figure out how to speed that up, I would love to, but it takes what it mm. takes. Well, I must say, I, I thought it was a really good book, and uh, I do hope uh, you'll get a lot of people buying buying the copies uh, of it. Uh, do you think this is a good, that noir fiction is really popular because of the situation we are all in right now? I would think so. And as I said, politics. I think so. I think that's why it still resonates. But as I said, I think that for me, noir fiction, you know, in a very entertaining way, really gets at sort of the basic questions of humanity. And and for me, um, you know, it is very much, um, you know, a direct line from a lot of the Greek tragedies to to noir. Um, in fact, there's a terrific French writer, Alain Robgrier, who wrote a book called The Erasers in the 1950s that basically takes the American detective novel and mixes it up with the Oedipus uh, tragedy. And there are direct references to Oedipus all over the place. Mm -hmm. And um, the detective is looking at a serial killer. The de detective looks almost exactly like one of the suspects that they're hunting. He looks mm -hmm. like one of the victims. And it's sort of this carnival funhouse a uh, book that is is terrific. You, you've gotten a, a, a request to uh, hold up. Do you have a copy of the book with you? 
Um, I'm in this shelf behind me. I'm sure I can find one. And sh if you'd show it uh, to the to the camera, just thieves. I actually, I think I, I told you, I really like the the book design, uh, which uh, in in so many books, uh, the really the design is really terrible. You can just see that the publisher just wants to get it out, and really don't they don't care about you know the artistic aspects of the design. I, I really thought that was good. Yeah, I had nothing to do with it. And if they had listened to my suggestions, that would have been horrible. Luckily, they, <laughs> they ignored everything that I told them I wanted. So why don't we why don't we uh, ask Sari uh, if there's some questions uh, from the audience? OK, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So people, if you have them, put them in or if it's easier um we can unmute you although you would have to chat us so we would know that you would want to be unmuted <laughs> but um actually i have a question um greg um i was uh wondering since there's so much sort of psychological and existential angst in in all these books and also philosophy in in genre of noir specifically um are there any novels or specific authors maybe that you would feel might be appropriate to be taught in high school? Because I know most of us don't read this type of literature in high school, but but I thought it could be perhaps interesting to teenagers. I think it would be. I mean, you know, the I think the difficulty with it is is they are violent books. And, right. you know, I should say that, that you know, I, I think one of the key differences between American crime writing and English crime writing is the prevalence of guns, um, you know, Luckily, British society does guns aren't as prevalent here. So they actually, you know, in some ways they have to be more inventive about how they kill off people. Um, but maybe, and this is someone that we didn't talk about that we should, which is Graham Greene, who, while British, he sort of is more in the American hard boil style. Uh, he wrote, um, and this is probably a great example, he wrote This Gun for Hire, which is the American title. In the UK, it was titled A Gun for Sale. A Gun for Sale would not have any impact on an American audience. I mean, that title means nothing, but this gun for hire does have resonance. The film, by the way, launched the career of Alan Ladd. Um, it's, a, it's a violent film. Brighton Rock, however, which was, I think, 36, that might be high school worthy. What do you think, Jim? I guess so. Yeah, I, I I don't know. Just curious. Graham Greene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough. It's tough, and obviously, high schools. You know, what gets taught in high school is a very sort of hot topic at the moment. And then uh, Green also wrote both the uh, novella and then the screenplay for the Third Man. Um, so, you know, Green has a huge influence on, uh, I think, the hard boil genre as well as noir. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would imagine that, you know, for uh, the high school students, noir would be no problem. Yeah. Uh, for the school boards to assign yeah. these books, it would probably be a great uh, problem. There, there was a question that I saw, uh, where does P.D. James fit in all of this? Oh, she's wonderful. She was wonderful. Uh, she is really a direct descendant, I think, of the uh, classical school. Uh, but, um, you know, she's, I just think she, she's really very, very excellent. Now, her uh, main detective, Adam Dagleish, is uh, a published poet, <laughs> which, uh, you know, he's uh, also uh, psychologically, he's, he's much more modern. Uh, but she was known as the queen of crime. And uh, I think she is uh, just really, you know, at the top, uh, at least in the modern uh, writers. What do, you, what do you think of P.D. James? Yeah, I, I haven't read a lot, but what I've read, I like. And then I know you mentioned um, Daughter of Time. Um, but I, I think uh, Shilling for Candles is also pretty terrific, which, you know, sort of, fits in our our time frame. I think that that was early 30s, maybe. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that novel in particular, you know, is very modern in a lot of ways. 
Mm. Other other questions I see. Oops, wait. I had another question actually. Um, Jim, you touched on this earlier, but um, Greg, I was curious um, um, if you could just speak a little bit more about the technicalities of how you develop your characters. Um, I know some authors will write out um, entire histories of a character that maybe the reader will never even be privy to, but um, the author knows it and it helps inform how they speak um, and how they interact with other characters. Do you? sketch something like that out at all? I don't. I would. I probably should. I don't. I tend to hold things in my head a lot. But yeah, I, you know, there's a, a lot of things that I know about the characters that, that don't make it to the page. And um, some of that is erasure. So I take things out. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, I, I just think about them all the time. There are some other questions. Um, what do you think of Philip Kerr? Someone would like to know. I don't know Philip Kerr, do you, Jim? I remember reading, I think, one or two of his novels, but it was so long ago. That, that's the thing, when, A, when you get old, and B, with detective fiction, uh, there's such page turners that, you know, you just can read so many. So I really can't give, uh, you know, I, I I read if I read a couple, I probably liked them, but I I I don't really remember. I'm embarrassed to say. Um, that's okay. We can go to the next question. Um, someone wrote, if I remember correctly, there was a George Orwell essay on crime fiction. In such such were the joys skewered British crime vis-a-vis -vis American writers. What is your view of the essay today? If you are familiar with it. I, you know, it's been a long time since I've read that, but I, you know, I think, I think he's, I think he's pretty correct, um, you know, but Orwell also, you know, I think stylists prefer the American fiction, um, you know, I think that, you know, to make a gross generality, I think that the, the really good American writers, Chandler, Hammett, Hughes, you know, I think their sentences are just terrific to read. And, um, you know, I think for the British, again, in general, there are some great British writers, uh, Graham Greene being one of them, um, that the sentences aren't as important. What's important is more the, the whodunit of it. You know, uh, Chandler also wrote a great uh, essay in 1950 uh, called The Simple Art of Murder. And he, he uh, Jim had mentioned A. a. Milne's book. He yeah, really just manages it. that. He just goes through yeah. and talks about how implausible it is. And he, I think he has like a seven point attack that he takes on it. Um, but Chandler also is sort of disparaging towards American crime fiction in the same essay. And it what, well, he was educated. What, he was educated in England. Yes, he grew up uh, in and, England. Absolutely. Yeah, and so uh, I guess he may have felt that. He was more English in his writing than American. Yeah, yeah, I, I think he certainly aspired to that, and yeah. he, you know, he he is complimentary of the English thing. He sort of thinks like a lot of the murders are totally preposterous, um, and I think he says of he likes Holmes a lot, but he says Holmes is sort of an outlier, um, and and he is. Uh, Holmes is is a very interesting character to take us back to the 1880s. You know, he's a drug user and, um, you know, he's not really interested in people, Holmes. He's, yeah. you know, he takes his cases based upon their challenge, not, not to help society or anything. Uh, there's another question. Um, someone here is or uh, was a classmate of Robert Ace Parker. Is he worth a mention? Yeah, I mean, he's sort of, he is, um, he, you know, he completed what Poodle Springs, is that right, Jim, which was an unfinished Chandler novel, um, and yeah. he certainly sees himself as carrying on that Chandler tradition. Another question, uh, Greg, your, your novel seems to follow in the tradition of psychological fiction, like Highsmith and Rendell, would you agree? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I hope it follows in a lot of traditions, but um, 
yeah, it's, I read a lot of Highsmith. Um, you know, luckily, I don't think that the my protagonists are as twisted as hers are. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she she's someone that I like I like quite a bit and looked at quite a bit. And again, you know, she I think she follows directly in the footsteps of of Hughes, who sort of got there before a lot of other writers. Quick question, if I can just interject, Go for it. Uh, Greg. Do you uh, compose on a typewriter or do you write it out by hand? A little bit of each, uh, mm -hmm. sort of depends on like how fast I have to get something down, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I have lots of scraps of paper that I've scribbled notes on. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think do a lot of composing on a keyboard as well. Mm -hmm. And so, so Jim, who who sort of I know you really like Dorothy Sayers. Who else do you really like from that period? Well, I like I guess. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, hmm. Nio Marsh, I think, hmm. is very good. Uh, her name, her first name was Edith. And mm -hmm. Naya, which is spelled N-G-A-I-O, is a Maori word. Her uncle uh, was a missionary. Uh, she's from New Zealand, and he was a missionary. And one of the meanings of the word is clever. And she was given that at birth and took that as her, as her name. I think she's, she's very good. Uh, Innis, I like. Uh, I haven't read all 50, but some of them are. Uh, and it's one of the problems with any writer that writes so many books. Uh, after a while, you, you do see repetitive patterns that uh, someone who writes a very few, uh, you don't see if they're, if they're good writers. Uh, I like, I, I like uh, Holmes before uh, that, uh, before our period. Um, well, Sayers is, is really, I think, you know, at the top. Although Edmund Wilson, who read uh, one of her books, said it was the dullest book he ever read, which I find that hard to believe. Yeah. I'm not sure, so sure Chandler was a big fan of hers either, if I remember that essay uh -huh. correctly. Yeah, she's, she's very controversial. Yeah. Uh, she's been accused of being anti-Semitic, which she at one point denied, but you know, I think one can say that uh, she may be, she may have been, uh, which was common at, at the time. Yeah, yeah. But, it certainly uh, applies to Patricia Highsmith as well, unfortunately. Yeah. So if, um, if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to ask. There's been just two comments in the chat, just for people maybe who aren't following the chat. It seems like people just want to recommend books or authors. Um, one person said Emma Lathan, Harry Kemmelman's Rabbi series. And then um, another person wrote in the opening sentence from Chandler's Bay City Blues. Uh, it must have been Friday because the fish smell from the mansion house coffee shop next door was strong enough to build a garage on. <laughs> so you have some very uh, knowledgeable audience members here. I'm sure there's more than two. Um, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do I think of Henning Meg? Kel, he is great. He was great. His Inspector uh, Wallinger si series. Uh, Scandinavian noir is, is very popular. Uh, I found Joe Nespo a little too violent for my, my taste. Uh, another writer that, uh, a German writer uh, I came across that I really like is Volker Kutcher, who uh, to my surprise uh, had one of his books, Berlin Babylon, made into, I guess, a Netflix series. Uh, but he, he, is, he is really quite good. Yeah, I, I haven't read the books, but the series is terrific. Yeah, I haven't seen the series. Yeah, and, it, and as, as you know, but for people who haven't read it or seen it, you know, it, it really is, um, you know, Germany before the rise of the Nazis or they're on the rise. And it's sort of a, a murder mystery uh, detective series sort of wrapped in the political turbulence of the time. You know, that, that's something that really impressed me was the setting. 
to come up with that idea where the Nazis aren't in power, but they're on the march and uh, you have people interacting in that, in that period. I, I thought that was very, very clever. And a lot of other people, I guess, agreed. I'm sorry, but I, I guess we have run out of our hour and um, I think we should wrap it up. So thank you so very much. This was so interesting and so much fun. And, um, and I've well, made notes about all these us. writers. I think we have a pretty good collection in the library, but I might have to add a few now. So thank you very much, Greg and Jim, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Shari, for taking care of the, the technical stuff. And um, we'll see you soon. We have lots more coming up thank in the you. next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Be well and read. <laughs> Keep on reading. <laughs>